Okay, cool. So apologies for the delay in the last uh, few lectures, but let's get back to it. Uh, the next couple of lectures are actually going to be pretty quick. There's not that much uh, content, but um, some, some cool stuff definitely uh, coming up uh, in the next few lectures. So to, to kick off, um, let's talk a little bit about some better approaches to search. We last lecture talked about um, A star and let's let's kind of start off from there. So the A star code, we, we uploaded a nice little um, example of this to my courses. You can check it out, but the kind of core of the algorithm is actually here on the right. I'm not going to go through this line by line, but uh, you can kind of see that the algorithm and the approach to A star, the code looks very similar that the, to what the algorithm is, is doing. Essentially, you have these two sets and you're exploring sort of the, you know, the frontier and adding nodes to your closed set um, as you go through that until you find your destination. Um, but let's kind of talk a little bit about the algorithm again against this code just to refresh everyone, right? So we start off and we have a source node. We add it to our queue. This comes out of our unvisited set. Uh, while we haven't found the queue or the, the destination, we, we have a, a destination node in mind. And while the queue isn't empty, uh, we then take the, the first node from that queue and see if it's the, the destination, which is in this case, in the beginning, it's just our source. But uh, as we go through, we're going to add more nodes. If it's not the destination, we're going to add all the neighbors, right? And then we're going to resort that queue based on the uh, heuristic priority, as we mentioned before, right? Whereas the only the main difference between Dijkstra's and A star is that you have this additional heuristic H that then allows you to prioritize the queue based on what to check next. Meaning, in this sort of uh, visited set or closed set, you're essentially looking at the nodes that have the lowest cost next and exploring those. So as soon as you get to the frontier where the cost of a node that you've added is above that of one that's already in the queue, you don't check that node, you check the node that has the lowest cost. So it's kind of creating this uh, fringe that's growing in a way that is connected to a heuristic. Uh, this is a very effective, for example, in a, a grid world type of scenario, for example, where the nodes are just nodes in a grid, right? And so if your heuristic is, uh, you know, uh, a measure of distance, like we talked about Euclidean distance or Manhattan distance or what have you, then the uh, heuristic will mean that you're always going to kind of go in a single direction unless you hit an obstacle. And then eventually the, the cost becomes so m large that you have to start to ex uh, explore alternative routes, right? Um, so yeah, this is sort of the A star algorithm. So, you know, the code is, is quite straightforward as you can see here. Uh, you have a couple of cues and you're sort of pop popping things around, comparing them to the heuristic, which is kind of contingent on the uh, data structure that you're using for the node. So in this case, it's a, it's a point in a grid. Uh, so the heuristic is quite simple, uh, but you can imagine it being edges on a graph or other things like that. Um, and so, you know, if you have, for example, a scenario where you want to have multiple paths, you can still do this, uh, but you're going to have to store those search nodes in, in, uh, in another list, uh, but you can also save kind of common paths and, and uh, pre-calculate them, especially if you have a sort of static thing, which uh, you know you can even encode this into your nav mesh directly and things like that. And so there's a lot of ways to kind of um, you know speed th these things up quite uh, substantially. Um, but so, so yeah, search, uh, you know, if you read like the original Minsky paper on AI, I think search is one of the first sort of tenets of AI because you can imagine if you have this open, uh, you know, if you have every solution to a problem and you have some ability to search through all of the solutions, uh, and we'll, we'll get to an algorithm that does this very shortly, um, but say we have that sort of, you know, world where we either have the compute to, to do this or the problem is sufficiently small that we can check every single solution and every single set uh, of combination of, of uh, decisions made in a particular sequence, then you can just figure out what's the optimal thing to do and choose that. And that's just a big, big search problem. Uh, so, you know, this is something that uh, the search is, is really kind of this core aspect of AI because a lot of what we're doing in AI is coming up with a search tree that is effective, that is efficient, because often you can't do that. You can't 
you know, codify every possible pathway through a particular scenario, um, you know, in some kind of dumb li limited cases like tic-tac-toe, might, you might be able to do that, right? But even for a game like Backgammon, it's, it's uh, out, out, of, out of reach. So search is, is a, a very, very effective tool and a very effective uh, thing that you can do uh, in general. But uh, you, you can do it for a lot more than just pathfinding. You can do it, for example, as I mentioned, for a series of steps to make a decision to result in an outcome. Uh, for example, Counter-Strike uses it for keeping uh, AI away from certain kill zones. Uh, and uh, Fear, which I'm not as familiar with, but Fear used pathfinding um, search for its planner. As I was mentioning, one of the things that you can do is perhaps have a set of um, you know, actions that an agent can take uh, to try to achieve an, an objective, each action has sorry, some amount of cost associated with it, uh, and you want to find the most optimal set of decisions made against a certain scenario or state. Uh, and as we get to the later part of the course, this kind of gets codified in the problem of the more general problem of reinforcement learning uh, that really turns this into a sort of what's called a value function and trying to evaluate the value of being in a particular state and sort of evaluating the different actions that an agent can take to manipulate that value and, and hopefully optimize it uh, with, with uh, regards to a sort of um, higher level reward function that it's trying to maximize over the uh, lifetime of the agent. Um, so yeah, just to, to make note uh, that this is sort of where my, a lot of my background is in AI is actually on the reinforcement learning and the machine learning side of things, uh, although obviously, the search things are um, quite common as well. So um, brings me actually to the next topic of this lecture, which is Minimax. And so Minimax to me is a very, it's very close to my heart because Minimax is actually a, uh, uh, this is the objective function for a machine learning uh, network or, or a set of networks called generative adversarial networks. Uh, and in those two, in that kind of regime, you actually have these two ML networks that are trying to kind of play what's called a minimax game and achieve uh, the equilibrium point. And the equilibrium point, point in a minimax game is actually the Nash equilibrium. So you've seen Beautiful Mind about um, about Nash and how you know unfortunately he he had a bit of uh, a tough life, but a uh, brilliant guy and and kind of realized that you know two players that are playing adversarially, meaning one player is trying to maximize their score and another player is trying to minimize their score, uh, also known as a minimax game in sort of computational game theory. The, the equilibrium point for this is what's called the, what is called the Nash equilibrium. And so it's a pretty cool thing. It gets really complicated once you get from like two players to many players, um, which I'm not familiar too much with game theory. But uh, in, in get generative adversarial networks, many of you might have seen some of these crazy results. For example, deep fakes is one of them, where you're taking an, uh, an image or a video of a person and transforming it into a believable video of another person, uh, and sometimes sort of <laughs> for, for negative effect. But but um, it's it's quite it's quite amazing what this small kind of simple idea is. And one of the best kind of visualizations of Minimax is you can imagine. A, uh, a like a tiger or a dog chasing a rabbit, right? So the dog or, or the 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 predator wants to minimize that distance because at a at a minimal distance it's going to be able to capture its prey. But the prey obviously wants to maximize the distance because at a minimal distance it, it gets eaten. So this sort of mini max game is occurring where for every step the predator is taking, the prey is trying to take steps. And there's dynamics in that, right? Because the predator is bigger, it needs to take fewer steps, it has energy, it has momentum. Whereas the prey is smaller, maybe it can has more like it can accelerate faster, but it has a lower, you know, maximal speed, whatever. There's a lot of dynamics in the scenario. And it's really interesting that these two very, very different systems can ultimately achieve some form of equilibrium. And that equilibrium ultimately looks like some kind of you know normal distribution in terms of the distance that is being kept if you can get to that equilibrium point, right? Often, that's not what happens. These things are innately unstable. Uh, and, and so usually the predator gets the prey or the prey manages to run away. So you don't often see in the wild, you know, uh, a, a dog chasing a rabbit forever. It's not, this, this is not a stable kind of scenario. 
So this is pretty cool. Uh, it has a lot of applications. So the uh, kind of at its core, Minimax is again like a, a heuristic based uh, thing. We're gonna talk about primarily the two player regime. So you can imagine a two player game such as chess or, or what have you, uh, or t even tic-tac-toe as a simple example. Uh, Minimax involves a depth first search. So what it's doing is it's trying to go down the tr this tree. It's going from one player to the next. So you have the maximizing player and then you have the minimizing player. And, and what it's doing is it's sort of exploring the, the moves that the maximizing player can take. And then it's exploring the moves that the minimizing player can take from that point. And it's exploring that state from that state on it's looking at what are the possible outcomes. And based on that can sort of come up with a, uh, you know, a, a series of options for whether it be the maximizing or the minimizing player, depending on what they're trying to do. So it's a pretty cool uh, idea. Um, it's a little bit uh, you know, tough to do unless you can do an exhaustive search of your state space and the, the action space. So like tic-tac-toe, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, because you can go all the way down to the end of the game and figure out, okay, if I take this move, uh, here are the possible outcomes, right? I'm, I'm going to put an X here, and then the next step is, well, there's eight other positions that the opponent can use, right? And I'm, and I'm going to explore from then on, what, well, I can do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And eventually I can figure out, well, what's the optimal place to start off? Right, but that's not going to be necessarily realistic for most games because the, the the state and the options are way too much, and so you kind of go down to a respective depth, and so you need to have some kind of heuristic uh, that that suggests what's a valuable thing. For like, for example, in in uh, chess, this is pretty well known, right? There are sort of you know uh, scores, so even if you're not if you didn't win the game, you don't have to wait until the end to know how well you're doing. Because you know, capturing a pawn or capturing a queen are, are fundamentally different valued events, right? So we don't have to go all the way to the end of the game to figure out what's the uh, best next move based on that, um, which is pretty um, you know valuable. So, in in short, right, at every level of the you know tr of the tree is essentially labeled with a min or max, right? This, which means in the um, is reference to what player is playing is it the maximizer is it the minimizer um kind of imagine the, the the maximizer and the minimizer they could be playing the same game so how do you know what the difference is and well you just the minimizer is trying to get a, the negative score of the maximizer right so for every point that you know in, in the same way that um the maximizer might be trying to uh, maximize their score and minimize the opposite player score and the other player is trying to do the opposite right so you're just subtracting everything or multiplying everything by by negative one to get the min and max but it's going to be dependent on your your system and this kind of algorithm is a higher level than this uh, so, so you know can kind of consider at that level um, so we need to, uh, as I mentioned, right, we, we need to uh, make sure that we have some method of scoring uh, the utility of different moves. So I mentioned the example with, with chess, but that can be quite complex. So uh, imagine a simple coin game. Uh, you have a stack of four coins. Uh, in turn, right, players take one, two, or three coins from the stack, and whoever takes the last coin loses, right? So we can make a tree for this and we can minimax it, right? Uh, and, and then, like, how do you move first? So here's the example of the uh, coin example, right? You start off with four coins. Player one can take one, two, or three, right? And the resulting state is the number of coins that are left, right? And so you can see here, player one took one, and so from three, player two can take one, two, or three, um, right? But they're, they've lost, so this one thing, we're not going to take that route, if I take one, then there's two left, and then player one is going to take one or two, but it's, they're not going to take two because then they lose, right? So uh, player one, and so in this case, player two loses if, if, uh, we, if everybody takes one. And so you can kind of see this fleshed out. So as a player, um, player one, right, the uh, almost optimal uh, case is, well, I'm not going to take three, right? Because, well, actually, I can take... Uh, I can take three, and then player two will lose no matter what. So that's pretty optimal, I guess. Kind of not sportsman-like, but optimal, 
right? If I take two, then player one uh, won't lose, right? They take one and then I'm gonna lose. So I'm not gonna take two, that's not optimal. Um, and then I can take one and then I can kind of follow this tree. And as you can see, right? If, if uh, they take two, then I take one and lose. I mean, it's, you can kind of follow and, and figure out, well, what's the most optimal set of choices here based on the, the best outcome for me, which in this case is taking three coins, um, which is probably against the rules because it's an obvious way to win. So, um, you know, what uh, one way of scoring would be kind of like the maximum depth of the tree. So in this case, we're, you know, we're going to sort of, you know, start off with uh, the, 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 the maximum depth. In this case, the, the maximum depth on the beginning is going to be, uh, you know, one, two, three, four. In this case, it's two. In this case, it's three. Um, and so that's one way to kind of look at it. Uh, but it's not always, you know, the best way. There's, there's a lot of kind of ways to think about it depending on the heuristic of the game you're playing. Um, so one, uh, as I mentioned, one of the uh, things I uh, that's a problematic with this method is what if your game has a lot of depth, right? Like before it terminates. Uh, and so you do a uh, minimax with a fixed number of levels or n ply look ahead this is sort of the, the fixed depth look ahead. Uh, each node has a value based on that heuristic function that we talked about. You've defined some kind of heuristic function uh, and you, you kind of push this back up the tree. So you can kind of imagine like, just adding it up. Uh, and, and, and this is sort of uh, a little bit, it, it, can, it can be kind of misleading in some cases, right? Because beyond this horizon, you're not necessarily, you could be in a very non-optimal place Right, I think a good example of this was actually demonstrated in uh, the original AlphaGo, and, and I'm not too familiar with the, the game, I'm not like a super uh, expert in that, but one of the very notable uh, things in that game were that the AI agent chose to do certain moves that were not human. Humans would never have made those moves because they were not intuitive. The game was such a sort of big uh, set of states that a human being would have never explored to that level of depth uh, the, the po the, that possible move. And so all of a sudden you saw this very creative move, um, wh which really meant that the AI was able to kind of look ahead way farther than a human player, which makes sense because this is a finite game. It's an adversarial game. It is a min-max game if you think about it that way. And uh, it was able to see, well, if I do this move here, I'm gonna go through this wonky state space that leads to this very, very, very optimal, uh, you know, result that that would never been been predicted. And so you you do that because you're going for such a depth of states uh, that that uh, maybe a human being would not be able to kind of process that far ahead. Um, and so this is the the downside of this approach is that you know and and um. Actually, uh, AlphaGo used what was called Monte Carlo Tree Search, which actually looks a lot like this. It's a, it's a game tree with pruning, uh, and it sort of samples the tree because the tree is so big. So that's where the Monte Carlo comes in. But we, we, we'll probably talk about that later. So, you know, think about, about heuristic, uh, sorry, tic-tac-toe. What, what would be a good heuristic with tic-tac-toe, right? Obviously, the outcome is that you want to have a line, a straight line of X's or O's, respectively. Um, but you probably want to kind of do it soon, right? You don't want to have to get all the way to the end or put yourself in a predicament where uh, you're, you're potentially, um, you know, exposing yourself to the risk of a stalemate. Uh, so you might want to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, Tic-tac-toe is a bit hard here because tic-tac-toe is an exhaustive search. It's very possible to go and, and, and look at every possible state of the game, right? The, the game has essentially... Uh, you know, two to the power of nine states, which is not that many, <laughs> you know, so you could literally search all possible states and, and, and actions thereof uh, in a reasonable and finite bound kind of computational time. But with that said, say it wasn't that simple. You could use a heuristic such as depth of, uh, of the thing, which is a negative uh, heuristic, meaning we, we're, going to optim we're going to choose moves that finish the game sooner with a sort of uh, expected uh, result, which is a, a win in our case. 
So um, kind of a good place to think about that. Um, so let's think about uh, this, this. So we just talked about this as a tree search. A tree search can be quite exhaustive, right? You may have a game at every and, and at each turn, uh, a player has say 10 different options, right? 10 different actions that they can take. And that results in another 10 and another 10. And so even at like a depth of three, you're, you're already, you know, 10 to the power of three uh, possibilities. And it can, can get really out of hand. Um, now, say we want to kind of maintain that sort of scenario and we want to uh, prune the tree in such a way. So, you know, like we saw in this example, right? I'm not going to, uh, if, if I know that this move I'm going to lose, I'm probably not going to explore that further. Or if I can somehow determine that, wait a minute, uh, this is optimal, I do this and I win, like why even check these other ones, right? Like why even explore the alternative options if I know that within a, a reasonable, now, it depend, now you can see it kind of depends on how you, you, you check the, um, how you check the actions. Right, if I start from one and then take two and then take three, right, because we're doing a depth based thing, uh, I might not know that taking three is the optimal until I get there. Uh, but that sort of starts to kind of bring up the subject of, well, you know, how do you choose these things? How do you prune them? And so on. So, alpha pruning or alpha beta pruning uh, is kind of doing this from the perspective of the two different players. In a way, it's sort of keeping a, uh, you know, minimum score that the maximizing player is guaranteed to get and a minimum score that the uh, sorry and the maximum score that the minimizing player is uh trying to get uh and so you this is kind of a, a way to think about this right like we we have a couple of bags full of good and bad items uh you're allowed to pick a bag that has items in it that you know you'll get one of the items in the bag but your uh, adversary uh, gives you items that you'll get out of the bag and is guaranteed to choose the worst item, right? So how would you choose uh, this, this kind of, you know, thing? Um, the, the, I'm, I'm not too familiar with this, this example, but, uh, you know, you can kind of uh, pick this apart a little bit in that how would you choose, how do you pick which bag uh, to, 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 that, that would be most optimal for you to know, right? So, right, uh, in a way, um, you, let, let's take a pause here and you can kind of think about this. I'm gonna hit pause the video and, and you should too. Think about this sort of scenario. Okay, I know for, for it might have been just a second for you, but um, this is kind of a, a difficult worded example, but the idea being, it's almost like do you we have a couple of bags with good or bad things in them you don't know right uh, or you can you can uh an adversary will give you an item uh that, but you know it because they get to choose uh the, the item it's going to be the worst item right so you're probably going to choose the bag because the expected value of that's going to be on average better right the so you're, it's um in a way, you're kind of keeping track in your mind of what's your maximum benefit. So for, for the, your enemy, for your adversary, they're going to try to minimize your score by giving you the worst thing, right? And that sort of, you know, is your, the, the, the lowest score, the lowest value you can get by getting the thing that your adversary is going to choose for you, right? Um, and because you know that, it's better to choose the bag because if your adversary is going to give you the, the, the floor, choosing the bag is actually going to likely uh, be better, right, on average. Now it's interesting, now you start to get into this whole mini-max adversarial thing because like what if your, well, your adversary might know that and they might offer you something better to kind of trick you. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's a little bit, it's not actually entirely, there's not enough information here to really make the best, uh, so, you know, the best, um, uh, selection and the best the best answer which is sort of how these things often happen in these sort of what's called incomplete games where you have incomplete information right so a game like chess for example is a complete information game you and your adversary have the same amount of information about the state of the game now you don't know what's in your adversary's head you don't know what they're thinking 
but you can look at the board and see exactly what they see. So this is a complete game, right? And you can compare this to something like a, a game like Hearthstone or Magic the Gathering or, or even Poker, right? Where this is an incomplete game because you don't have complete knowledge of the state of the game, right? Your uh, adversary is, is uh, withholding information from you and you're withholding information from them and making decisions under that kind of uncertainty is, uh, can, can be a little bit harder or more complicated. Um, so anyways, let's go back to alpha beta search or alpha beta pruning. Uh, so this is again a depth first thing. Uh, and alpha values are maintained and they usually start at, um, you know, negative infinity. So as the maximizing player, you start off with a minimal score of the, the worst score you can get, which is negative infinity. And the beta values are the opposite. It's positive infinity. And this is the best score, uh, the, 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 sorry, the... The, the highest score that the minimizing player can expect to get. And right, and as you go through the tree, you're updating these two options. And, and as soon as you see a path uh, for the maximizing score that is, uh, that is lower than your minimal score, you just don't explore that path anymore. You're like, well, this is worse, so I'm not gonna go that way. Uh, and similarly for the minimizing player, if you see a score that is higher on a path, then you don't go that way, you just prune it. Right? It's sort of like saying, uh, why would I even explore this pathway? There's no way it's going to be better than what I've explored so far. Uh, so this is kind of a very uh, simple, um, low-cost low, you know, thing to prune the, your, your search space. So you might actually be able to reduce the amount of search you're doing by a substantial amount. Um, and so you do this kind of to the ply or to the, to the depth that you want to do. Um, and you kind of imagine, uh, assume that uh, you know the the maximum of the min nodes is backed up to the parent. So usually the parent's a max node, uh, or it can be the opposite. It doesn't really matter. As we mentioned, a max or a min in this case is the difference of multiplying everything by negative one. So you can flip between the the, the cases, um, right? The values then offer to the grandparent of these mins uh, as a potential beta cutoff, and you just kind of compare. Right, and then you just go down based on, and you terminate based on, uh, you know, the, a the the heuristics uh, demonstrating that you're above or below the the alpha or beta value as appropriate, depending on the the, the sort of place you're in. So, right, uh, search then becomes, you know, can stop below any min node that has a, a beta value that is less than or equal to the alpha value of any of its max ancestors. So once you kind of go below and that, that value is above, um, then, um, or sorry, let below that, then you, you can stop. And, and in the same way, search can be stopped below any max node having an alpha value greater than or equal to the beta value of its min. So th this is sort of the... I know that's like this keeping this in your head is a little bit annoying, but the but the uh, the, the intuition is kind of you understand that uh, the idea being that a maximizing player is not going to continue down a path if that path uh, means that they're going to uh, not do better than they've already done or, or minim and the minimizing player is kind of uh, the same. So right, so you can kind of see in this example, right, a maximizing player uh, takes this. Uh, action let's start on the right side of the thing takes our action p right that gets you to four um and then you go down to q and that keeps you at four right so you're you're kind of okay min you, you don't really you can't really prune uh at that first step right because in the first step each one of these options is sort of independent in a way uh and then your each one of them has a different sort of um you know uh alpha value and then from, from P to Q, right, the beta value is adjusted, but you can kind of see that in both cases of uh, T, right, the, the, the maximizer has an option to get to, to six, and, and because of that, the, you don't keep going on that path. In the same way as here, like on the left, right, this gets pruned, the F gets pruned because, um, you know, the, the uh, maximizer is seeing one, uh, and that's worse than six because the maximizer is trying to maximize the value. And six is already better than one, and six is already, and, and you can actually get to six this way. So it's these are not like the most uh, <laughs> eloquent ways to kind of explain these things. You're just updating things as as you go through. But here, let's take another uh, kind of worked out example, right? You can kind of see here that the uh, options for the max and the min 
of seven and one don't often you don't you don't get that even though um in in many cases seven is going to be a higher expected value but it's never going to happen right because in this case the the minimizing player is not going to choose the k action uh knowingly because uh they know that by taking going left by going to j uh you're never offering the maximizing player the opportunity to get to uh seven right and so you can kind of follow this logic here uh in, in a similar fashion right when you can see often that there's this sort of like spread between these two things uh you you end up choosing one or the other or in this and like for example in the case of c you only choose one action um it's it's a little bit um it's kind of hard to see in these uh diagrams uh actually one of the better ways to kind of look at this i think is looking at the the pseudocode uh where you're just kind of going through and you're flipping between you know alpha and beta and so let me let me pull that up here from the wikipedia which whoop there we go um and, and so you know here you can kind of see we start off at depth zero and you know if the node is terminal then you know um then we just are done this is a recursive kind of you know thing if you're the maximizing player you start off with the value being negative infinity and for each child you go down and you check that the value you maximize either your current value or the uh, value you call the same function on the the, the child with the depth and you're kind of flipping between the two so you can see you're passing in false right if the returned value beta is over the cutoff then you break uh, and you return the value otherwise you set the alpha value to that maximum and then you rinse and repeat over and over again and the uh, minimizing player is just the inverse of that um, and so i think this is a little bit more intuitive to kind of look at than in these these uh these diagrams which are like i don't know what those numbers mean dude um you know it's not clear if it's an alpha or beta or, or both but here all you're doing is you're just maintaining this value uh and you're going through it uh, and, and that way you can sort of save that that alpha value or that beta value and you only explore the nodes that um you know fit that heuristic that sort of meta heuristic of whether or not you're, you're better off or not so cool um those this is an example i'm not going to work through it uh because i don't actually you know um know where this came from so i'm not going to try but uh that's pretty much it right the the depth of the search for this evaluation you know really does matter and the order of the tree branches matter we talked about this already um you know how do you choose which action to explore first given that this is a depth wise thing you can find that you just explore the deepest branch only to find that the branch next to you is two layers deep and is more optimal than the one that you just explored so uh how do you do this and in fact um some ideas from a star or dykstra does come in a, you know could, could you do this in sort of an iterative fashion where you kind of go to the crest uh up to the crest of this frontier before then looking at the other branches and it's almost like you're following this heuristic and you're only exploring to a certain depth before you keep exploring um so that's one way to do it so applying kind of a breadth wise thing to this uh but that's a little bit beyond the scope right now so that's it uh, for, for this. This is sort of exp you know, exploring some alternative ways to do search, for example, with a minimax and then applying alpha beta pruding uh, to a minimax search. Uh, very, very useful set of techniques that uh, you'll find uh, very applicable to a, a lot of these sort of adversarial type of scenarios. Um, and even more than two player, you can kind of immediately see that if you have a turn-based game, with more than two players, you can just apply this. Instead of having a min and a max, you have like, you know, uh, a one versus all. So the maximizing player and everybody else. Or, uh, you know, you have a bunch of these uh, individually, or you can even use what's called a soft max distribution and things like this to kind of choose the correct thing for a particular player. Um, and even a scenario where you have, you know, players making the same like decisions at the same time. So like runtime games, you can apply similar ideas, but instead of having kind of this swap, each one encodes the sort of, you know, new possible set of states uh, given a sort of combination of possible inputs from users at a given moment or players at a given moment. So 
a very general thing, although it gets very complicated quite rapidly. Well, cool. That's it for uh, this, and uh, see you next time.